Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to all of you to this 11th Urbis Dialogue. My name is Luisa Weiss and I work for the ICLI World Secretariat in the Capacity Center. I will be facilitating this webinar from the technical side and want to introduce you to how we use the system that you have logged on to. For the duration of the presentations that will be given, you will be muted. However, we will have a question and answer session in the end of the webinar. And we welcome your questions and suggestions throughout the webinar. Please give them to us by typing them into the question box that you see in front of you in the GoToWebinar control panel. Also, if you have technical difficulties, please type them and I will be happy to assist you as far as I can. I'm now handing over to Jessica Kavanik, my colleague from the Africa Secretariat, who will introduce you the Urbis Dialogue series. Over to you, Jessica. Welcome everyone to the Urbis Dialogues. The Urbis Dialogues are a webinar series designed to deal with urban challenges, to share experiences, and connect change makers in our urban biosphere. Today's topic is the importance of scale in understanding urban patterns and applying nature-based and community-based solutions. The Urbis Partnership is the urban biosphere and design. Urban biosphere and design. You can see the advisory board and a series of our partners. Urbis is the second and is hosted by ICLI, Local Government Abilities, Cities Biodiversity Center. The 15 webinar series is a global platform for online dialogue. It is held the first Thursday of every month and is archived for repeated viewing. It brings together representatives of cities and local governments and leading experts from around the world to all share experiences and address specific urban challenges focusing on sustainable use of regional biodiversity and ecosystem services in order to support social development and rapidly urbanizing world. The next Urbis webinar is titled Cities and the Natural Areas Regional Networks of Green Spaces and will occur on the 12th of May and be led by Chantal van Ham from IUCN. For today's webinar, we have two speakers, Paul Downton and Richard Register. First up is Paul. Paul is a prize-winning architect, writer, international speaker, green building and ecosystem pioneer, and early advocate for action on climate change. Paul Downton is Deteo Master of Ecological Urban Design with Deteo Masters Academy in Shanghai and chief consultant with Green World Solutions. His projects include Keynote Green Buildings for Adelaide Zoo and the ANU and the internationally awarded Christie Walk Development. Founder of Urban Ecology Australia, his vision of ecological cities is supported by years of working with communities. In 1989, Paul founded Australia's first community organisation focused on climate change and was 2008 South Australian's finalist for Australian of the Year. With a doctorate in environmental studies and 30 years of teaching architecture, Paul is acknowledged as a world leader in sustainable city making and theory and has been called an Australian icon of sustainable development and neighbourhood pioneer. Please welcome Paul Downton. Good morning, afternoon and evening. Um, hello. Hopefully, you can see the first slide in this presentation. I'm going to talk about scale in, in the broadest sense because um, it does cover a lot of ground. And we have a global problem, which I can I'll, I'll talk about bringing back to our cities. The scale of our problems are global. In the next two hours, the whole world will change. There will be 17,400 more people on the planet, 
There'll be over 6 million tonnes more carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. 3,000 hectares of rainforest will be lost. There'll be 12,000 hectares more desert. 1,700 hectares will be covered by cities in addition to what's already there. All in the next two hours. Humans are a force of nature operating at the global scale. But all this has happened incrementally, one small piece at a time just like the clearance of Kangaroo Island in South Australia, which is ironically now famous as a wilderness destination, but it only took 40 years to decimate the, um, the native vegetation of that island. Change is a constant, and when we think about cities, it's like a river. You can't step into the flow of the same street twice, yet the street abides, the street's still there. We could say the same about cities. Every time you look, they're different, but they're always there. What, what maintains the city, what maintains the street, is a set of patterns which are repeated. We are interesting creatures. We demonstrate our power with what we build. We, we build a lot, and it's getting, <laughs> it's getting quite remarkable. We build as high as mountains. We create islands, uh, we, we change the flow of rivers massively, we bridge chasms with what we build. But why do we do all this? Uh, it, it, we talk about cities, I'm, gonna, I'm talking here about the scale that cities work at, different levels of scale, but why do we do it in the first place? We do think about building in many, many ways. Uh, it's a way of creating real estate, and that's not always a successful exercise, tied up as it is with a, a, an economic system which is perhaps a little antithetical to the way sustainability needs to operate. We use buildings as a way of making shelter. It's probably the primary reason we built in the first place. We try and create objects and places of beauty to feed that's some uh, unquantifiable aspect of what it is to be human. We express power and strength through the way we build, and we've done this for centuries. We build to provide safety and security. Um, and we, when we try to make uh, places of tranquility and grace, all of this we do, and we do this at any number of scales. We build to celebrate the spiritual, sometimes in grandiose ways, some, we, 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 we build to support trade and commerce, one of the primary purposes of cities is to support trade and commerce, and all of the buildings and infrastructure of any city contribute in some way to that. And we build to facilitate and celebrate community, and this can be at the scale of a public plaza or something much more intimate, and we build interestingly enough, to protect, enjoy, and restore nature. This is something we're going to need to do more uh, as we've done so much damage to nature on this planet over the last few millennia. Other creatures build. They, they manipulate the environment to build extensions to their physiology, which is essentially what we're doing. They do this, other creatures, to breathe where they could not otherwise breathe, stay warm where, where they would otherwise freeze, stay cool where they would otherwise be too hot to survive, and reproduce where they otherwise could not. A bird cannot reproduce, make a family, or continue its existence without building its nest. Its process of building is that integral to it as a creature. And it's the same with us. We must build to survive. I defy any one of us to go out into the wilderness and survive. Uh, we just don't know how. We're so used to being in a built environment. And one of the first things we would do would try and find stones and sticks in order to create shelter. And we've been doing that for a long time. Been building stick by stick, stone by stone, brick by brick, we've transformed the planet quite literally.
starts in many small ways, but they soon start to add up. Those little pieces, those small scale activities we undertake result in world changing activity. And our building culminates in the greatest social invention we've, we've yet come up with, which is the city. There are greatest creations, our most beautiful, most terrible, most troubled, and most powerful and hopeful creations. It's through our cities that we manage our resources, manipulate the environment, and it's through them we'll make or break this remarkable planet. So they couldn't be more important. Dynamic cities depend on high levels of accessibility, connectivity, and liveliness. Truly dynamic cities are about life. And life can be in the materials, and as a result of how they're applied, the small scale of how we operate, even down to the level of the individual bits and pieces we make things with, affect the overall liveliness of the city, and are connected in a way through, through patterns which I'll talk some more about. The lives of those who make those materials and components, and if you're talking about ecological cities, the lives of those people need to be full and dynamic too. And if the definition of eco is based only on energy and resource considerations, the result will be dullness and industrial monotony. If the definition includes the living world as it should, then we're looking at a, a, a very different thing. What we have to avoid is a reductionist view, which is where you sort of give a flower to an economist who will then dismember it in order to find out how much it weighs and so forth, and it's life essence is destroyed. We need to understand where the value is and the value is in nature. Real eco, real ecological thinking in regard to urban systems includes the connectivity of people and living systems. And living buildings must support life in all its forms, from mixed bricks made of bacteria to buildings grown from sea. So the scale that we can think about goes right down to literally the level of a seed and how it then connects through to construction material. And it's not enough to have good components if you don't have the right things in the right place they don't work very well. It's a kind of an obvious statement but it's not as obvious as perhaps it should be. <laughs> Each component of the city should contain the essential characteristics that we want to see in the whole system that is the city. And it's easier to understand the components of the big picture at smaller scale. So if we can get a handle on what's happening to the city at a scale where we can kind of uh, comprehend it and feel it more, then we perhaps can work better at the scale of, of manipulating, operating, managing, planning uh, the city as a whole. The smallest details of buildings, after all, carry information about the city. We can see from this slide, for instance, that there's heavy reliance on air conditioning, um, and we can extrapolate from that and imagine what a, a gas-guzzling, inefficient urban system this must be part of. Door handle uh, tells us a lot about the creatures that create urban environments and that's us. We do things from a very anthropocentric point of view, not unnaturally, in fact quite naturally, but we also have to now more and more recognize that other living creatures need to be integrated into our thinking about urban systems, and um, that includes creatures which have not been domesticated by humans. And I think in terms of cultural fractals, it, um, even that door handle is like a cultural fractal. It conveys a lot of information very economically about the larger picture. It's like fractals that contain the bigger patterns of which they are part. The bigger patterns of culture are found in the small patterns of daily life. And an urban fractal is the smallest piece of the urban system that possesses enough of its essential characteristics to define the larger city. Each fractal, if you like, is a seed, um, a neighborhood containing the urban DNA for the whole city. DNA, of course, enables individual organisms to respond and reflect to the circumstance in which they develop, uh, while, whereas they all follow the same 
basic set of rules and principles, the individual responses of the organisms um, is a response to place and circumstance, which is what the very best cities and human systems are. Patterns are the key. And this, of course, is a big part of how archaeologists reconstruct the patterns of life in ancient cities. We need to, in a sense, be archaeologists of the city of the future and see what patterns we want to see there. And we can recognize that cities in which people demonstrate by affiliate and an intimate scale, putting flower pots out on the balcony, those cities are more likely to be those uh, that invest in nature and do things like plant urban forest and take care of other living, uh, living creatures. With regard to scale, it's no accident, perhaps, that the scale of the tribe, the village, and the neighborhood are so similar. It's at that scale where we can uh, communicate with enough people to feel part of a social group, um, but you don't have to talk to the same person all the time. If you have arguments with somebody, you can avoid them and still be part of a larger community which is supportive of all the individuals within it, even if they are having arguments. And it's something I think we're going to have a difficulty ever escaping from. We should recognize, in effect, that we are tribal creatures. And that translates in urban systems to the neighborhood. And if we work at the neighborhood scale and get that right, we can look at hopefully getting the larger city right. And we need to avoid monotony. Monotony or diversity, uh, we have choices. The values of the whole system are embedded in the parts that make it, including in those sorts of choices. The constraints of early industrialism are giving way to the fractal promise of new material techniques like 3D printing, which is again another way of looking at the very small and how it connects to the larger whole. But if the making of its components are exploitative or the people who build the city can't afford to live in it, it's not ecological in any sense of the word that I understand. But for dynamic outcomes at the scale of the city, the dynamism must be there at the scale of the individual and the neighborhood, which suggests an entire civic agenda about how things are done. Everything's connected to everything else. Cities are ecosystems. They're defined by the relationships between organisms and their environment and their living systems, which are cultural constructs. We can always change them. But if we don't pay attention to scale, how can we expect to meet the expectations of citizens in modern post-industrial mass society whilst retaining the subtleties, diversity, and social and aesthetic richness of traditional towns and cities? We've barely begun to tackle that as an issue. I like to think in terms of the, uh, the ideal city in a way as being an ecopolis, and it is comprised of ecologically, socially, and architecturally complete urban fractals, each plan to fit its bioregion and reside there as a regenerative force. So the city in this concept is part of the living uh, bioregion and is there to support and help maintain it. But how do we get to a thing like that? How do we get there? Well, humans did not get to the moon by simply flying higher. Uh, if you keep trying to fly higher and higher within the atmosphere, you'll discover that there's an absolute limit that you can't go beyond. It needs a different thing. You've got to make another step. And just as um, uh, President Kennedy said, we'd, the Americans would get to the moon by the end of the 1960s decade, when he said that, nobody knew how they would do it. Uh, but he set the goal, and the goal was clear, and from that, uh, the, the, the application of knowledge and purpose and technology and the whole culture of that society focused on the possibility, the, the actual practical means of getting to the moon. I think uh, we sh should be looking at the whole concept of ecological city making in a very similar way, decide we want to get there and get on with it and try and work out how to do that. And I see the, these uh, Urbis webinars as very much part of, of that effort, which is now being made globally. And then what? Well, if every project, every project is an opportunity to make a piece of the future at whatever scale. And most projects are relatively small scale. Very rarely to get a chance to do a whole neighborhood, but you can work within the neighborhood scale, uh, both socially in terms of community and in terms of design and planning with the view of the, of the larger whole of the city, but rather than get um, 
it, it, the whole city is too big a thing for many people to think about, but the neighborhood is something they can relate to, understand, and work with. And I think it's fair to say that most citizen action around the world operates at that neighborhood level, and it's through that you get the best results for our cities. And then when we look at applying technology physical artifacts, simply having physical elements like renewable, renewable energy and green roofs uh, can't guarantee the city will be sustainable. All these things have to be in the right places, connected, designed, and configured to contribute to a genuinely, genuinely sustainable performance. Above and beyond such things as schools, meeting rooms, halls, clinics, and sports stadiums, community infrastructure is made up of those spaces and places that facilitate the essential workings of a healthy society. And getting the scale of those things right, and getting the, the, the patterns of them right, is the key to getting the bigger picture right. These places and spaces need to be the right scale for their purpose. Unfortunately, this, this aspect of design is often neglected. Um, and the, image here from Brasilia is, is a, a very much a postcard of the, the, the modern city as it evolved until recently where people were not properly integrated into the, the picture and neither was nature. So just as pipes and wires must be correctly sized and connected to enable liquid and electronic currents to flow and deliver, so community infrastructure elements have to have the right size, shape, and interconnections to support community formation and interaction. You could say that if buildings and infrastructure, you know, the roads, pipes, wires, etc., and the public spaces form the hardware of the city, then the community is arguably the city's software. Um, we can have all the bits and pieces, but it's then how you operate them that makes all the difference. Now, the essential characteristics embodied in an urban fractal are about patterns of relationships. Well, what does that mean? Consider, for example, how you meet people. There's a couple of different ways you can think of. You could bump into somebody at five kilometers per hour and say, hi, friend, and uh, go off for a coffee or whatever. Or you can bump into them at 50 kilometers per hour and be confronted with a, a radically different um, outcome for the next, well, probably the rest of your life. Obviously, the five kilometer per hour meeting pattern is much more human, uh, much more, um, uh, much more contributory to to good civic life and healthy human life. Um, but we seem to have planning around the world still, which focuses on the 50 kilometer per hour meeting, uh, or at least a movement of people at high speeds without consideration, without enough consideration of how they eventually meet. And Christy Wall project I was involved with in, in Adelaide, the roof garden there, of course, doesn't have any poisonous guided missiles. The essential characteristics of a community are to do with behavior, and we see that in patterns of relationships, and we see that reflected in the way uh, architecture and city form are, are built, are built expressions. They're all built expressions of our collective response to patterns of behavior and worth studying for that. Um, Apple Yard did this sort of study uh, quite a few years ago now and looked at the patterns within a street, comparing different streets of the different rates of traffic and how that affected the interactions of people within the street with one another, with their neighbors and so on. And it, it was a very clear correlation between light traffic and a very active socially active street and heavy traffic and uh, people having very few friends, acquaintances and, rare, and, and much more rarely getting in touch with each other even in a, in a casual way. So we are constantly transforming the environment in a way that's the good news. We can take the stuff which isn't being worked out so well and uh, we can make it better. This was again Christy Walk and here we've introduced a whole range of community and ecologically positive elements at a small scale in the middle of the city, which has then in turn impacted on the larger city bit by bit. And you can take this approach and do it to things like this streetscape, and um, which is not terribly well worked out. Transport is the focus here because it's a street, and streets are thought of as, as places for cars to move still. 
uh, whereas really they should be a lot richer and considered in, in their full richness. So start to change it and you have sitting, walking, and much larger areas where people can communicate, you can harvest the storm water, use that to uh, take care of the water balance of the city a little better, and introduce uh, transport systems which are less damaging than individual fossil fuel motor vehicles. Doing this bit by bit in any neighborhood around any city gradually improves the whole city. And over time and very quickly, that can add up. And so if each development is what um, in China they like to call an integrated low carbon urban fractal, then development can take place in order to suit whatever the conditions are. You just do it wherever you can do it. Don't have to rely on master planning as an approach. Just make sure that what you do do, or how you do plan for individual places, individual neighborhoods, incorporates the elements you want in the larger whole, in the, in the whole city. So each of those integrated fractals would contain a number of key characteristics. For instance, green corridors, pocket neighborhoods, um, community infrastructure, and each one of them then reflects that. So this is how bit by bit you remake the city. And if you're starting, um, as in they do in China, with whole new cities, and we'll see a lot more of that probably through India, and I suspect in Africa over the next two or three decades, then you can start to plan cities from the beginning, aware of the fractal components, aware of all the elements that need to be incorporated, and then hopefully, through that kind of way of thinking, arrive at the ecological city. The entire planet, Lewis Mumford observed way back in the 60s, the entire planet is becoming a village, and this was, he was saying this before the internet, and as a result, the smallest neighborhood or precinct must be planned as a working model of the larger world. I think those are very wise words, and uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Now, Richard Register um, was scheduled to present the, the, the second presentation in this webinar. Unfortunately, Richard uh, is not able to be with us, and he sends his apologies, but he has prepared, he has given me his, his presentation, uh, and I'm afraid you're going to continue to hear my voice <laughs> for a little bit longer as I go through Richard's uh, presentation. Now, Richard, Register is one of the founding fathers of the modern green or eco city movement. He's author of the first book to be published with eco city in its title, and he's an indefatigable champion of the eco city idea. He was the founder of the International Eco City Conference series that began in Berkeley, California in 1990. It's gone around the world since, and it's recently been held. The last one was in Abu Dhabi in 2015. And the next conference in the series returns to Australia. Uh, after 25 years and will be in Melbourne in 2017. Uh, Urban Ecology Australia ran the second international conference in Adelaide in 1992. Uh, Richard has worked extensively in China and can claim credit for popularizing the eco-city concept in that country. He's acknowledged there for introducing that idea. He's one of the few people presenting genuinely creative solutions to the making of a healthy eco-city future, solutions that go way beyond the predictable business as usual approach of some of the mainstream urban planning and design professionals. He was founding president of Urban Ecology in 1975 and founder and president of Eco-City Builders. His latest book, and he's written a few, is World Rescue, an economics built on what we build, and it fits his vision for compact ecological cities to an economic framework in which healthy construction replaces the war machine as a driver of the world's economy. Richard thinks big, and here, are, here is his presentation. Richard and I uh, worked a fair bit together on the concept of fractals, by the way, so I'm afraid um, this is by way of extending that concept. This is a presentation, Richard. This is a presentation on, er, on habitat fractals with emphasis on eco-city fractals. First, 
A fractal is a fraction of a whole system with all the central components present and best arranged for synergistic functioning, something like a complex living organism within a complex living natural environment. This could also be thought of as a system with integral parts or organs. In terms of people living together, we can begin to imagine this relationship of integral parts by looking at the integral urban house of the Farallones Institute, Berkeley, California, with its water collection in a cistern saving precipitation for people and fish, people eating fish. Human waste goes through a composting toilet that enriches a food garden. Solar energy heats the house. Materials are recycled in connection with the outside world. Bees pollinate the flowers and produce honey, etc. So this is a, a, a relatively early attempt to really get all that integrated. Step up, one step up in complexity and numbers of community members is in this drawing by Richard for a compound house of three families. Systems include connected playhouse, treehouse for the kids, connection of parts of the house by above ground linkages, like terraces or bridges, making the system more three-dimensional than if linked only on the ground level. Then more specialized spaces like shared potato and a wine cellar, large medicine cabinet verging towards a tiny clinic, rooftops for enjoying views and sun, plus the features of the urban integral house such as garden and recycling of human and kitchen waste into the garden. Both the integral house and this shared multifamily house are almost like fractals of the town potentially an eco-village or an eco-town. An eco-town fractal can reflect the model of a natural environment. On a very modest scale, we can see specialized areas organized rather like we see in a tropical forest. Understory that is shadier and cooler, a canopy level where in the forest most of the action goes on, and an emergent level in the fresh air, breezes and views, where the tall trees, and in this drawing, where the people dwell. Within a city, we can imagine an area large enough to reflect all the major systems of the larger systems of the city. This becomes an eco-city fractal. An eco-city fractal with housing, commerce, education, some food production, and nature, in this case a restored creek, in clear evidence. The entire set of integral functions can be on an area of only two or three blocks with pedestrian street and proper angles to sun and local weather and climate, as in this proposed project called the Heart of the City Project, proposed for downtown Berkeley in California. Zooming in, this proposal features a small restored brought up from an underground pipe along with a small public plaza. Building arrangements feature multi-story solar greenhouses and rooftop public access. The whole arrangement is very dense and mixed in useful functions. The local San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit Station is just off picture to the lower right. Using such thinking, we can imagine generic transitions as in the three drawings that follow. Here, we, in this drawing, we have a typical downtown, this drawing from around 1985. This has several uses in the hypothetical downtown, but with commerce radically dominating, it is a car-dependent central business district, not an eco-city fractal. Here, we imagine reconstructing the same site to bring up and bring back the creek as a literal part of nature in the city, and develop pedestrian streets, paths, bridges, and so on, and begin to retire the car dependence while setting up systems that recycle and run much more so on solar energy. Building up and out, we see here an eco city fractal inside a city that is transforming into an eco city. Sun angles determine much of the design, compactness serves a larger number of people per land area, cars have disappeared replaced by pedestrian and bicycle features. Urban orchards provide some food and education for the young about farming and seasons, and the air clears up, revealing blue skies and long distance views. A whole eco-city town can be seen as a fractal of a larger eco-city pattern, either standing free in a natural or agricultural landscape or as a neighborhood of a city. Here, residential views face outward and commerce and culture are your front door, with recreation on the roof between skylights, pool, 
restaurant and cafes, again with views provided by high prospect and service to many people very efficiently delivered by more density and diversity all provided at the same time. An expanded town as a hill here, uh, or maybe town as a small range of mountains, suggests Richard. Here is uh, a compact set of horizontal surfaces set two or three stories above one another, filled in with mixed-use development linked by foot and bicycle bridges. For about six times as many people as in the last picture, we're verging on what could be seen as a fractal of a large city or small eco-city in its own right, with vineyards, orchards, sustainable logging, solar greenhouse, food production, etc., etc., linked to the outside world, mostly by train. But how transition from today's cities, mindful of the lessons of eco-city fractals at various scales, and by the way, note that as the scale goes up, more and more functions become possible. Though so there may well be upward limits as to total population density and height determined by dynamics, determined by local low energy circulation, energy availability, the strength of building material determined by gravity, thermal inertia, and circulation of fresh air, availability of sunshine, good soils, local biodiversity to be maintained, and so on. Now, looking at the San Francisco Bay Area from a US NASA satellite, the gray areas are urban, and 90% or more of it is low-density, car-dependent development, plus considerable, very low-density, even more radically car-dependent development is in the green areas close to the gray. But we can imagine a transition toward eco-city centers, all of which are fractals of what could be called an ecotropolis, in Richard's terminology, existing in a healthy bioregion cognizant of global impacts on our planet. Here we see the San Francisco Bay Area ecotropolis when low density development is removed and thousands of acres of agriculture and natural features are returned. The bay has increased in area and depth due to global heating and sea rise, but now the eco-cities, eco-towns and eco-villages that emerge from the connecting sprawl of city centers, district centers, and neighborhoods united by a slab of asphalt and concrete are a kind of galaxy of fractals of various scales of universal eco-city design. Like in many ways, the complex living organisms they can be compared to. These can harmonize with the bioregion. Here's an eco-city zoning map, which can guide a long-term transition with centers becoming fractals of the general eco-city whole design concept, with complete healthy living communities each part of the whole, along with restored natural and agricultural lands and healthy waters. The areas of highest proposed density are in bright red and pink, then next most dense uh, red, then orange, then yellow, then yellow green and dark green. Over many decades, as infrastructure ages, do not replace lower density car dependent infrastructure far from the centers, but instead add density and diversity of functions to the centers. Now, this is from the 2009 book Manhattan, A Natural History of New York City. Here we see an overhead view of Manhattan Island in the upper center with the other boroughs of the city, Brooklyn. Queens, etc., surrounding the island. The author, Eric Sanderson, has adopted what is essentially the fractals concept and a basic eco city layout in his ideas for healthy transformation of the larger New York City area. This is a satellite image. Here we see an image almost identical in basic principle and layout. Uh, to those generated by the application of eco city zoning that you, you saw a couple of images back. So this is taking a, uh, this is another, as it were, example of how eco-city zoning works and can or could work for existing cities to make that transition that we need to make. This maybe has a little less natural landscape relative to agriculture in the in the mix, in the mix place and circumstance, and always eco-city making should be. To cognizant of place and circumstance. 
uh, Richard says, and I agree, uh, this is a magnificent book if you're interested in either EcoCities, Fractals, and Mapping, or New York in particular, you need to know it. I believe David Maddox would uh, concur with that. The basic ideas of fractals and EcoCities are beginning to be accepted and implemented around the world in the 2000s. Here we see an idea for Rotterdam in the Netherlands. For low-lying areas, the city district and neighborhood centers could be shifted to areas uh, where in, in flood prone areas infrastructure can be constructed on mounds of elevated earthen materials particularly important in times of rising seas both for protection from flooding and preventing climate change by radically reducing greenhouse gas production by shifting away from machine and high energy use dependency by design Instead, design eco-cities, eco-town and eco-villages in this ecotropolis pattern, each a complete community of which is also an eco-city fractal due to its completeness and nature-conscious design. In this case, and in the, in the image after, note also, and in the last image, I beg your pardon, note also that even as the seas rise, some before we are smart enough to design so we can return to the natural dynamic stability and natural evolution, marshes can be recreated to buffer future floods and small areas on mud flats and former very low density development can become new eco-communities. Here we see a scenario for the San Francisco Bay Area with today's shoreline abstracted as a dashed line and the water edge with marsh and development representing elements of a future arrangement. The idea of building on elevated mounds of earth has been with us since the Sumerian civilization four and a half thousand years ago. It works for compact eco-development, but is impossible for sprawling car-dependent development because of the immense quantities of earth that would be required with that option. All of this arguably leads to an, an arrangement based on the eco-city mapping system which can lead to far better urban zoning and planning shifting density of habitat and quality of life for all life on the planet into an ecotropolis pattern in a healthy bioregion and biosphere. Here, ecologists have mapped out the bioregions of Northern California. Each bioregion has many consistencies of species arrangement and relatively similar climatic and geographic conditions. The pink wedge shaped outline just left of center represents the view we see in the last two images. The Central Valley, for example, is very flat with deep soils. An inland climate is much warmer with more distinct seasons than the central coast of California. The Sierra bioregion is higher, rockier, rockier and colder. The central coast is mild in temperature range and wetter than the Southern California and not very wet as the north coast here called the Klamath bioregion. Bioregionalist pioneer, the late Peter Berg, mixes the bioregional thinking with cultural consciousness and comes up with a somewhat different notion of bioregions as they might occur in the consciousness of people who truly sense where they live in natural systems while spreading out somewhat over natural bioregional boundaries. He proposes biocultural regions that look more like this in the mind of the San Francisco, California, Central California region. He calls this the Shasta bioregion because the very northern end is Mount Shasta an almost mystic and beautiful mountain from which emerges the main river, the Sacramento River of the biocultural region, is mine, and relating somewhat to the native inhabitants of the region. He, call, he calls understanding these geographical areas and building and living in them in a healthy way, re-inhabiting the region. This region might also be seen as a biocultural fractal, the next scale up, ecologically speaking, which would be the continental fractal of the planet's biosphere. Within this fractal, there could be several ecotropolises, the San Francisco Bay Area ecotropolis, the Sacramento ecotropolis, and perhaps the much smaller Santa Rosa ecotropolis, and smaller yet, South Lake Tahoe ecotropolis, each with their fractals, which would be eco-cities, eco-towns, and eco-villages. So for the next Shasta biocultural region, the next fractal up in scale would be continental. It would be North America. Finally, in terms of whole natural biological systems, we have the biosphere. Intimately tuned to non-biological but biologically influenced conditions of temperature, precipitation, climate, 
water circulation, and so on. And finally, a relatively simple if massive energy delivery system that we all depend on, the source from our star, the sun, uh, for 99.97 of the energy that drives both climate and biological systems on Earth. The conditions on Earth and the conditions of the solar system are so different, fractal relationships could probably not very meaningfully, meaningfully be applied in the comparison, but space and sun, gravity and energy flux, etc., need also to be clearly understood and responded to properly for health of living systems and ourselves as human beings, individually, collectively, and in relation to all other life on the planet. And that's the end of Richard's presentation. Thank you very much, Paul, and um, also for replacing Richard. This was very nice. Uh, we now want to um, transition to our question and answer session. So again, my call to the audience. Um, if you have questions or comments or want to discuss with us, please type into the question box in front of you. Uh, we are happy to engage in discussions with you as well. Please raise your hand for that. And um, yeah, we're waiting for your input. I actually have a question myself to you, Paul. So um, you were saying that we should basically go back to a more harmonized way of living with nature. Um, what I'm missing a bit in your discussion is the economic transition, because in my view, um, what is still in the way to this harmonized living is basically how our economy works now, which is, as you said many times, it's, it's very car-based, it's, it's based on uh, large shopping centers and a lot of concrete. So how do you imagine that transition? Do, do you... Are you just um, thinking about a more agricultural-based economy again, or what is in your mind here? How can we manage this tra transition, first and foremost? Well, I think in, in, in the small ways, it's already beginning. It, it's a shift back towards a recognition of our dependence on what we grow, rather than what we mine. And you can see that transition starting to take place in, uh, even in the realm of building materials. And now uh, there's uh, very tall buildings being built and proposed made out of timber rather than concrete and steel. That to me represents a very strong shift away from uh, non-renewable resources to renewables, which uh, you can, you know, you can grow wood, you can farm it, you can maintain it, you can hopefully over time learn how to actually have sustainable production of timber and with that timber build your cities and towns. So there's a shift taking place within the existing economy um, which is which I think is, is quite positive and you're getting things like uh, um, urban farming is now becoming everybody wants to be an urban farmer <laughs> almost. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's a very definite shift towards a recognition of the, the merit of living things as the basis for urban activity. That's both building and eating. So I, I take um, I take some comfort from that. And in the on the other hand, in the bigger picture of how the economy works, um, an economy based upon the notion of constant growth can't maintain itself on a on a finite planet. So uh, the, the changes that are going to have to take place there are going to be interesting and probably more than a little challenging and maybe a little bit beyond the scope of, of, of our capacity to deal with right now um, uh, in this webinar. But I think given the way the interest is there now in, I think, in community, in neighborhood, in materials that you can grow and sustain in urban 
agriculture and so on, all of that suggests uh, a, a shift that's taking place at least on the edge of mainstream society. I think it's starting to come through into mainstream society and then most of the uh, professional institutions and I would say an awful lot of the world's city administrations are now recognizing that uh, the goal of becoming an ecological or sustainable city is not only vital in terms of um, environmental and social outcomes but it's going to be a necessary part of whatever the world's future economy is all about. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I, I see you're very optimistic there and, and I, I agree with your assessment. The, the change is starting within the existing economy. Um, I have another question. What, what do you think about overpopulation? Will we, with the ecologist way, also be able to accommodate all those many people that are on the planet nowadays? Um, well, personally, I think so. Yes, I think we can. Uh, we don't so much have a problem of... Um, overpopulation is a problem if people can't get the resources and the food and the water and everything that they need to live reasonably well. It's more a problem of distribution of those things rather than the absolute numbers. And, of course, it's, it's well known now that the inverted commas, advanced economies, of people in the advanced economies are starting to get um, either flat or even negative birth rates. So once you get a certain level of what we call development, it appears people, the, the, the growth of population becomes something that is either can be managed or stopped or even reversed. At the moment, we've got a, a global population explosion, but like everything else, that comes back down to things happening in individual countries and places, and all of that will change. People, we don't all live forever, so there's a, there are natural forces at work, yeah. which, um, which which I think we need to learn to work with in a in a more positive way. But I think it's a big mistake to blame overpopulation on its own as a problem. You have to look at the, the equation, and I can't remember how it goes, but a number of people have put it forward, an equation which includes energy and development, uh, and you multiply that uh, and resources by, by population to get the full impact. We use far more resources to, to live, to feed ourselves, and so forth, than we need to. I mean, the percentage of food waste around the world now has reached some obscene level and there are more people who are obese than there are people who are starving. So we, we in a sense, have demonstrated we've got the capacity as a species to provide for ourselves. What we haven't demonstrated is a way of sharing that capacity and dealing things fairly. Um, and that's the real problem. Mm. Thank you for your assessment, Paul. I, I have some more questions from the audience now. Uh, Alam Sader Shafkul, I'm sorry for the mispronunciation, is asking um, what do you think about unplanned cities in less developed countries, such as Bangladesh, um, where disaster-affected poor people are now migrating away from the cities? Because... Uh, most of the city po uh, population does live in slums or informal settlements. Um, so what's your idea on this unplanned development? You, I think it's hard to blame the people in those settlements for the lack of planning. Uh, I tend to be more impressed by their capacity to make... Um, a vo yeah something like a viable human settlement in, in extraordinarily difficult conditions. I think these are areas where governments haven't quite got a handle on what they need to do yet, even though the information is out there and is available. And I think uh, the city governments around the world are beginning to share the knowledge that they've got about how to make things work, including how to take unplanned settlements and make them function better, as they have in, um, in parts of South America. And 
w I think one of the big problems with Bangladesh is uh, the, the sea level rise, which is almost a given now, and in places anywhere, anywhere that's at very low uh, relative to the sea level, I think there need to be a properly thought through migration strategy so people can retreat from areas which are not going to be viable because of the rising sea levels. And Bangladesh, I'm sure, could do with that kind of strategy more than most places. But it does require good government and it requires the people to get engaged with that process. Thank you. And that's actually where our next question goes to. Alvaro Galan says he's a landscape architect and he's wondering what the next steps would actually be in designing eco cities or designing eco city fractals. What, how can he as a citizen engage in that? Um, at the neighborhood level, start in wherever he lives, his street, his neighborhood, um, start to share the, these sorts of ideas, uh, share the possibilities and the positive potential outcomes of going down, if you like, the eco-city path um, in terms of health, uh, amenity, and even potentially the economy as we move more and more to, to green technologies and so forth. Um, recognize that cities never stay still, they're constantly being redeveloped, regardless. Um, and that's the thing that struck me a couple of decades ago. Change is there all the time. Cities are being remade all the time. Uh, we, we live each day as if it's a normal day, you know, this week's like last week. But if we look back a, a few years and there's been a lot of changes in the meantime. So all those normal days somehow result in a, a big change. Recognizing that, if our questioner was to look forward and say, okay, well, I can start to be active in my community, make changes, and being active in the community can be at a very small and immediate level. Um, I don't know the exact circumstance, so I can only speculate, but we'll also involve at local level of government where where most of the important work gets done in terms of uh, making cities work. When those things start to happen, they do get noticed, it does make a difference, and from those sort of grassroots initiatives, uh, I believe it's from those sorts of initiatives that we are now seeing a, a larger movement towards green cities around the world. So wherever you are, whatever scale you can work at, uh, even if it's just in your backyard, it's worth making the effort because it all contributes to change. Or I should say, it all contributes to directing change in the right direction. Okay, thank you, Paul, for this um, motivational statement to all of us. Um, again, I call out last chance to pose your questions to our panelists. Um, please type them into the question box. Or if you want to engage in a discussion with us, raise your hand. Okay, um, we have no more reactions from the audience at this moment. So I would say thank you very much, Paul, for this very interesting presentation and for answering uh, all our questions. And um, I hope to welcome you to one of our other Herbist Dialogues. And I hope to welcome you in the audience as well to our next uh, webinar. Thank you all and uh, goodbye for now. Thank you for your facilitation. <laughs> You're welcome.